Any second. Where's everyone? I can skip class too. Should I, should I skip class? Maybe. All right. Um, let's see. So, um, as some of you may or may not know, um, today is actually the deadline where uh, people who have talks at ice and the needs to submit it. And I think it's in an hour and a half. Is that, is that right? Okay. Uh, so um, there are a couple of options. I can do uh, two things. Um, one is to talk, to do this uh, artifact um, game show, which I uh, wanted to do last time. We didn't have time. The other option. Can you hear me okay? No, we lost you like in the middle. You said one option is the game show and then the other option is. Oh. Yeah, I'm gonna switch. Yeah, I'm gonna switch network, so hold on. Okay, okay how's, how's, my, how's my signal? Can you hear me? Yeah. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Can you hear me now? It used to be this commercial, I think, a while back. It was singular before AT&T even existed as a cell phone uh, provider. Anyway, the other thing is actually I made a uh, educational talk on uh, flexible coils, which I thought actually would be a good uh, thing because we haven't actually talked about hardware at all uh, really in detail. So that's, that's another option. So uh, let's let's put it to a vote. Um, let's put it to a vote. So I think we can actually do probably both because uh, the talk is uh, like supposed to be thirty minutes. So um, then we'll have time to do the uh, the artifact show. What do you think? Should we do that? Yeah. yeah okay. All right, maybe you can give me some feedback. Sounds good. Can you give me feedback? Laura, you be quiet now. Okay. Um, all right, I need to get into my MRI mode. So um, I'm going to do that. I need an inspiring background. There you go. Ah, all right, I'm ready. Okay. Play. Smart show in the window. All right, share screen. Okay, feel free to share your, uh, your video so I can see your faces. I know if I'm doing okay or not, and if it's uh, understandable or not. This is meant for trainees, so that's, you know, this is pretty much what you are. So I think it's, uh, it's really appropriate. All right, um, yeah, so this, this actually talk is a part of a, a whole session about uh, MRI quails. And so the other things actually describe kind of like what they are, how to build them, uh, and then how to do what's called pre-amplifier decoupling. And then uh, I'm supposed to talk about MRI coil, uh, flexible coils, which is what my group's been doing uh, for um, quite a while now. All right. Okay, so I'm just gonna read the script if you don't mind, because uh, I wanna know if the script is okay. So MRI received coils are near field antenna. They are designed to maximize the signal at the Larmor frequency. Uh, while many designs exist, the use of arrays as elements is key for improving images in R. 
and also parallel imaging acceleration. So we haven't talked about that, and that's actually the next topic that we're going to talk about. Well, actually, by the way, before I even start, I can, any announcements? No, I think just that the homework is due Thursday, but, and labs are this week, but I okay, think. Okay, pe do people sign up for tomorrow? Yeah, so I think there were four groups who signed up for tomorrow and four for Friday. Okay. Um, so I think if your group hasn't signed up, please do. Um, yeah. Okay, anything else? I think that's it. Okay. So we'll talk about parallel imaging acceleration probably next week. And I think next week is the last week, kind of. Yeah. yeah. And, then, and then the week after that, we'll do the uh, project presentations during, um, during um, the same lecture. time, I guess. During lecture time. Okay. Um, okay, while smaller coils have uh, limited penetration in comparison to volume coils, they also pick up much less noise from the sample. And this is kind of what we talked about uh, in the past. So you can see that the surface coil provides much higher SNR close to the coil uh, than a volume knee coil, but it has a limited uh, field of view. So to maximize XNR, proximity uh, of the coil elements to the body is key. Hence the need for flexibility. If you have something that's hard and not flexible, it doesn't, it doesn't get necessarily get close. And so this is really important. You can see really nicely in this image compared to this one, um, how the SNR differs as coils gets close to the neck. This is a particular problematic area in the C-spine. It's called the C-spine because it's like a C. By the way, stop me if you have any questions. To gain both SNR and coverage, arrays of elements must be used. The number of elements have dramatically increased since multiple coils also offer imaging speed through parallel imaging acceleration. To cover different body parts, manufacturers have designed many different arrays for the different applications. Uh, here's just an example of a 16 channel knee coil, a head coil, cardiac, this is 32 channel soccer ball, 16 channel interior, and this is the eight channel brass coil. You see that each one of them slightly built differently for different applications. But bodies also come with different sizes and it's impossible to equip every clinic with all possible coil types and fits. So often a coil would misfit some patients. And unfortunately this is very common for pediatric population. So. Um, this is one of my favorite papers out of MGH. Uh, to demonstrate the importance of fit, they constructed dedicated head coils for different age patients from neonates all the way to seven year olds. Um, if you put a patient, now this image is very important. This figure is very important. Take a look on the right hand side. If you put a patient with a small head, in a four-year-old coil, the SNR would be significantly better than scanning the same patient in an adult coil. Okay? That's because the elements are just closer. But on the left side, you see the most remarkable result. And this is something that we haven't talked about, which is called G-factor acceleration. Basically, when you try to image uh, using what's called parallel imaging acceleration, you actually leverage the fact that you have multiple channels in order to speed these things up. And these are non-orthogonal functions that we use to encode, like a you know, case-based encoding is pretty much Fourier and these are orthogonal uh, measurements, but uh, coil functions are not orthogonal. So when you try to then invert the system, you get amplification of noise. And that depends on the amount of acceleration that you do and also the coil geometry. So on the left side, you see the most remarkable result. Uh, and, and this map basically shows what's called retained SNR. So if you see a red, that's pretty good. That means that the SNR is retained. You don't lose SNR because of acceleration. Whereas if you see something more bluish, then you, you know you lose a lot of you know a lot of SNR. 
So scanning a neonate in a neonate size coil will have ne negligible G factor penalty when accelerating the scan nine fold. So nine times acceleration, you get very little penalty in, in SNR due to the multiple coils. You still lose square root of nine, so three fold SNR, because you uh, just sped up, you, know, you collected less samples. That you still lose. But beyond that, in addition to this, often you also lose more. Um, while scanning the same patients in an adult coil will result in 400% reduction in SNR sometimes. So that basically makes it useless. Like you can't really uh, go that far anyway. So this allows you to do it and this doesn't. Okay, so ne neonate in a neonate coil, that's the key. So for coil size matters, to enable this, Flex, uh, to enable this, flexibility uh, is the key, since flexible coils can naturally adapt to geometry. Uh, now, for example, here's a beautiful work from the Montreal group showing a head coil that can adapt to different patient sizes. That's replacing the entire array of seven coils that were designed by uh, in the previous slide uh, into a single one because it has actually flexibility built in. And this is pneumatically uh, moved by air pressure. But you can see how the coil elements can move and produce much higher SNR for small heads uh, while still producing very decent SNR for uh, larger heads. So way more than just a regular commercial coil. Is that neat? Hey, Mickey, I have a question. Yeah. In the very beginning, Greg Scott mentioned that, you know, he had a, a slide about, can you be too close and also in Nishimura's book, I think he mentions dielectric losses if the electric fields from the conductors pass through the, the tissue. Do you ever um, find the point where you induce extra noise by being too close? Uh, not really. We're talking about millimeters uh, and actually there's regulations that really don't let you go that close anyway. So, um, all these capacitive coupling are really when, when you're talking about like a millimeter away or something like that from, from the tissue. What's, what's the regulation? I'll, I'll go over some of it actually. Okay. It's four, it's four millimeters. That's the regulation. But Thank often you. it's actually more than that. Yeah. I also have a question on the previous slide. Yeah. This one? No, previous. Yeah, so um, why is the relative SNR high in the adult coil in, oh no. No, no, the, re the, the relative SNR, if you actually take a small head and put it in a four-year-old coil. No, 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 get... I'm sorry. The one that you just showed us. Yeah, the, that slide. Okay. Yeah, so why are we getting high values in the draining veins in the adult? Draining veins? Where? What, what, what draining vein? <laughs> Where no, not that slide. Is there, is there a lag? Oh, it could be. <laughs> the one with the I four think a, yeah. SNRs. Is that the one? Yes. This one that I'm seeing now that has four, two axial slices and two coronals. Yep. Okay. So in the adult coil, there's high values in the draining veins. There's those- Oh, spots. like up here? Yeah, do you have any idea why that's happening? Yeah, that's in flow effect. So they measure SNR by measuring pretty much the image. So, and, and the, there is an increase in signal that coming from this draining vein because of inflow effect. Inflow effect, okay. So basically the flow comes into the slice and it wasn't being imaged before. And it doesn't uh, basically spins are has not been excited. So the entire slice being is kind of knocked down all the time, gets into a steady state. But then blood, the new blood that comes in, has not been affected by the RF and has oh. not been excited. And so now its magnetization is much higher. And that gives you a high signal. That's a really nice observation, by the way. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Yeah, keep going with those observations. Pretty cool. Um, but can I ask a question related to that? Yeah. Can you go back to that slide? Sure. Yeah. 
Yeah, so Sam was asking about the draining veins. So for veins, it's outflow in a sense, right? It's already gone from arteries to tissue to veins. Uh, well, it's inflow so, to the slides. Yeah, I know, but I'm just wondering. So those red things, which are even higher than the yellow, are those arteries? These? Yeah. No, the yellow here is actually, no, this is, this is real signal. Uh, improvements is just sometimes you see a little bit of contouring because of the uh, color bar, the color choice. That's the problem of actually putting colors as uh, you know, it creates false, false uh, contouring. So what you see here is pretty much gray matter. Gray, gray matter has a slightly higher signal than white matter. And so that's why you can kind of see uh, the gray matter here in yellow, but it's just when the, you know, the green turns into yellow. So it's no, really but my, small. My question is about your four red dots. These one? There's one there and there's one at five o'clock and one at seven o'clock and one at four yeah, o'clock. These are inflow, these, these are vessels. That's what I meant. Those are arteries? Because they're inflow? No, they're probably veins. Yeah, the top is the sa superior sagittal sinus and the bottom two are the transverse sinuses. Yeah, they're veins, but, but it's, you know, it's flowing into the slice. It's a slice selective imaging. So it doesn't matter. It's not inflow uh, or outflow. It's just inflow oh, into the slice. Okay, but those those other things, those red ones, are so much more signal Here, than the what? yellow. Yeah, because they're red. There's red and there's yellow. Right? I was yeah, just wondering. right. Okay. But that's because they, they will be bright. The, the image would be bright there because of uh, it has to, nothing to do with the coils. It has to do pretty much with um, just the spins. Right. right. And okay. so really what you need to do is to do the ratio between this and this. Okay. And right, you see thanks. that the, this red is much redder than here. Yeah. Okay. Right. Okay. Okay. So hopefully I convinced you that uh, flexible coils are useful because you can adapt. So next, let's talk about some of the issues, challenges, and technologies that go into designing and making uh, these coils. Okay. Um, so before we start, let's uh, let's see what's inside actually a coil. Okay. A coil is a loop that inductively couples the, uh, to the sample. The EMF generated is passed through a transmission line is in, then amplified. Okay, that kind of what we saw, you know, and we, that was kind of the model that we talked about, right? Okay, um, so here's actually the situation. So to maximize the signal, capacitors are added to create resonance at the Larmor frequency and match the impedance of the coil to the transmission line. So you've got this loop that has certain inductance. What you do is you put tuning capacitors such that the resonance frequency of the coil or its impedance will be the lowest at uh, the Lamor frequency. And so that would generate the most EMF at the Lamor frequency in the coil. And then uh, you also want the impedance of the coil to match the transmission line, which is usually 50 ohms, although some systems are 75 ohms. Um, so you have, to, uh, you have to actually look what, you, what you're matching to. Okay, so you add these capacitors and now this is resonant and this is very sensitive to the signal at the Larmor frequency coming from the spins. However, in this configuration, during transmit, um, so this is just the receive coil. So now you're gonna be transmitting RF while this is resonance, okay? So in this configuration, yeah, during transmit, the receive coil will also capture the immense energy, the immense transmit energy. And this poses, severe risk to the equipment and the patients. Because if you think about it, if you want to maximize sensitivity at the longer frequency, if you transmit at the same time, I mean, then you would get like huge amount of currents within this, within the coil. 
So that is a huge problem. Okay, and that's because the coil is designed to be just receive only. So there's another transmit coil. If that was a transmit and receive coil, well, then you just transmit and then you switch into a receive mode. So that's not a problem. Okay, but because this is a receive only coil, you've got another transmitter. You have to somehow detune this coil when the other one is transmitted, transmitting. Okay. Now to block currents during transmission, a resonant tank is used to create high impedance on the coil. It is typically driven by actively switching a pin diode. So the idea here is that you have some inductance here and you put this pin diode and in normal receive, this pin diode is not conductive. So basically, you know, the uh, differential signal, the signal, the MR signal just goes through. It goes through the inductor, it's not a big deal, uh, but it just goes through into the preamp. Now, when you bias, uh, when you bias this, uh, this path, then effectively that turns on the pin diode and now this thing gets connected and it becomes in parallel to the capacitor. Okay, can you see that? So this effectively gets connected. And now you, you got yourself a, um, a capacitor in parallel with an inductor. And in addition to this, all this, whatever the, the rest of the coil is. And so the size of this inductor is set such that when this is closed, when the pin diode is driven, then effectively you're creating very high impedance at, uh, at the coil input. So really no occurrence can actually circulate through because of this high impedance. Okay, okay, does that make sense? All right. Okay, and I need to annotate and then clear. All right. Now, here's the deal. Regulators define a single fault condition as a condition in which a single um, mean for reducing risk is defective, okay? So when you have just this part, this is a single mean to reduce risk, okay? There's just one way, you bias, you bias the diode, uh, and then this uh, turns off. But what if this doesn't work? Okay, that's a single mean to reduce um, to reduce this uh, the safety uh, uh, re reduce um, risk. Well, what if it doesn't work? And when does it actually doesn't work? Well, what if the coil is not connected? Somebody forgot to connect the coil, and so now DC bias cannot go and turn on those pin diodes. Well, now you've got yourself a resonant coil sitting on a patient without it being connected. So the system doesn't really alarm anything and it can introduce very high current and actually endanger the subject or the patient. Okay. Um, this situation can occur when the coil is left unconnected and the pin diode is not driven. Therefore, cross diode must be used. Okay, so they put cross diodes here such that if actually large currents go through here, that would actually op you know, uh, create current going through also those cross diodes and they'll start conducting. And then effectively it will create high impedance. Okay, so when large currents starts um, you know, going through, uh, you'll have high voltage across the cross diode, we'll, we'll turn them on, and then basically you've got yourself now the same trap working. Vicky? Yep. That capacitor that says DC choke should be an inductor. What? That capacitor labeled DC choke should be an inductor, yeah. right? 
No, no, it's a DC choke. So, uh, so okay, so here's the thing. If you apply a bias here, uh, if this was connected, then you would turn on the cross dies all the time. Yeah, but you don't turn on the, that. I'm just saying that DC choke is an inductor, right? No, it's a capacitor. It chokes the DC, so there's no DC going through. Okay. Um, okay, now uh, in some cases, a fuse must also be added as well to mitigate situation where neither of these are working. So it depends really on your topology, but you have to uh, think of a single fault uh, condition where anywhere if a component is being you know, damaged can be a situation where there's no blocking. If there is a situation like that, then you have to have a diffuse uh, and the fuse is kind of the last resort that if there's a lot of current going through here, it will blow up and basically the coil will start functioning, but will protect the subject. Okay. So sometimes you have to use it, sometimes you don't. It really depends on what the circuitry that you're using and how you actually, you know, it depends on the details. So some companies like, I think uh, Siemens, they use a fuse. G don't use fuses. Um, I don't know what Phillips does. Okay, let's quickly talk about regulation. Now, in order to market coils to be used on patients, manufacturer must meet many regulators, regulators specification. Some are listed here. Okay, so there's actually a whole list of them. And each one of those will have a huge amount of documents that you have to follow uh, pretty much uh, with all the regulation. So SNR, image uniformity and image quality, surface heating, uh, which for example, you have to maintain less than 41 degrees at every place that touches the, this, uh, the patient. The decoupling circuit that you're using any electromagnetic compatibility, for example, uh, you have to have a spacing of at least four millimeter distance from any conductor that, uh, that is uh, on the coil. And then there's electrical uh, and mechanical safety. So electrical safety, you know, you, you don't want to get a shock, you know, electrocuted and so on and so forth. That's not even RF. I'm talking about just electricity. And then mechanical safety, of course, you don't want to get your finger crushed in some hinge of a coil or you know, things like that. And biocompatibility uh, is the, you know, the material that the coil is made of. If you touch it, is it gonna hurt you? People will, for example, make coils out of um, mercury, for example. Um, and if that spills, that's not great for your health. If you're going to use a lead conductor, if you're going to use, for example, uh, you know some colors or certain substrates that may contain something which is uh, uh, toxic to touch, so that that is all um, uh, regulations that you have to obey. And I got all of these, you know, the uh, ISO, C, IEC, UL, NEMA, all of these are organization that creates these standards and specs for that. Now there's a good reason for all of this. Um, here's an example in a recently published report on MRI related FDA adverse events uh, reports, a 10 year review, the authors found that out of 1548 events that were reported over 10 years, so it was about 150, 160, uh, 155 a year on average, that's not insignificant, it's just in the US. Um, so 257, uh, sorry, 906 were thermal related to something related to thermal. 250, 257 off the thermal uh, were, oh, hold on. Were, thank you. 
play and slideshow. All right, now I have to reshare. Okay, 257 off the thermal where contact with some object. And so 138 out of this 257 that were contact with an object uh, were identified as those um, uh, as though directly linked to heating events related to MRI quiz. Okay, so 138, that means that is about you know, 13, 14 cases a year, you got yourself, somebody gets burnt or, you know, some RF burns or some other burns related to that due to MRI coils. So this is a serious thing that you have to be aware of and not, it should not be taken lightly. Any questions? Okay, so here's an example of one of the tests coils have to pass under the IEC 60601 impact testing. Okay, so look at this video. To perform the test, simply drop a 500 gram steel ball from a height of 1.3 meters onto the top of your medical device. Okay, so this is one of the tests you have to drop half kilogram ball on every point, every point of your coil, like you have to drop, okay? So imagine what would happen to a ceramic capacitor, a detuning circuit, pin diode, or RF trap under this test, okay? Now, while the device does not need to work after this test, that is not a requirement. It must remain safe under a single fault condition. Okay, so that is the key. So it needs to, when it fails, it needs to fail in a safe way under a single fault condition. So if one thing breaks, okay, if two things breaks, well, okay, whatever. But if one thing's break, then, uh, then it should fail safely. Okay. So this is no wonder why coils look like they do. Heavy armored devices, pretty much. This is one example, but there's there's other these type of tests. This is just mechanical. Okay. Um, okay. So uh, so this is no wonder why coils look like uh, they do. Heavy armor devices. Still, manufacturers and researchers have successfully developed, you know, semi flexible coils. These often use rigid PCB and copper traces, but leave room for hinges such that uh, the coil can conform at least in one dimension. Here's an example uh, out of Stanford of a 64 channel coil, Stanford G, uh, where you have these hinges here. So it can, this coil can actually bend in this direction. This is another one, 128 channel. And that's kind of like another, you know, coil that somebody can wear, I guess. Um, so this approach is similar to putting an armor, right? It's possible to move, but the armor is heavy and limits motion. As Din Jardin would say, this is the way. For those who watched Mandalorian, I don't know if you have. But is this the way? Yeah, is this the way? Okay. So here are some commercial uh, so-called first generation flex coils. They're made with flex PCB. Um, you can see the plastic cases protecting the vulnerable electronics, while flexible foams uh, covers the elements. These can mostly lightly flex in a single direction, but you can you can buy those. 
right? That this is this is something that they can just go and buy. And we actually have this coil and um, um, in our MRI suite. Okay. Now to move into the next generation, we will explore several technologies and solutions that enable fully flexible coil arrays. These include new substrates, new conductors, new flexible components, and new interface electronics in order to be able to um, um, allow the construction of coils that are truly, truly flexible, and perhaps even stretchable. Okay. Let's go back and talk about a little bit about SNR again. This is kind of, we cover this in class a little bit. <clears throat> now, copper is a great conductor. Replacing it with alternatives may increase the losses in the coils, right? So you can have some losses in the coil, uh, but fortunately, the main source of noise in MRI actually comes from the subject. So this gives you a leeway to use new materials, which may be less conductive without suffering from image SNR loss. So even though this may be larger, you know, if this is still dominant, then that's not necessarily a problem. Now, since the flexibility enables the coil elements to get closer to the body and improve SNR, any subtle change, uh, any subtle loss that still can be seen maybe, can be compensated by the proximity, hopefully, to the subject. Okay, this is our own work, leveraging uh, printing of silver inks onto flexible uh, plastic substrate to form uh, coil arrays. Um, the idea is that first the thin plastic substrate is loaded into a screen printer. A screen with a coil pattern is lowered onto the substrate. A conductive silver uh, microflake ink is spread over uh, the patterned opening in the screen then forced through onto the substrate below. The substrate is removed and then heated, uh, dry, uh, then heated, drying the ink and making the conductive foam. Capacitors are formed by printing traces on both sides and using the substrates as dielectric. Now, while the substrate and inks are flexible, we'll still need to connect the traces and add the matching tuning and detuning circuitry that we showed before. In this example of the posterior portion of the 12 channel pediatric blanket array, we interface to the printed coil via flex PCB bonded using conductive epoxy. To avoid any bulky component within the antenna portion, we move the matching and detuning circuit away from the coil and so you have pretty much a transmission line here that takes you over there. But that also uh, makes the transmission line part of the entire coil, which is usually not the case in traditional coils. This is a, a compromise that is done in order to maintain flexibility. So now you have a flexible device over here, and this is not necessarily so flexible anymore. Here's the final uh, product. This is a PhD, I guess. We encapsulate the elements in PTFE, which is a Teflon, add fire resistant foam, and encapsulate with flexible, cleanable fabric. And the result is a super light and flexible pediatric coil. With IRB approved protocol, we tested this coil on pediatric patients at Lucille Packer Children's Hospital. The images that you see here show very high SNR and excellent coverage on three months all the way to, uh, to five-year-old. So three months, two-year-old, and five-year-old. So this is a short, like, you know, Shreyas showed those images, right? Like uh, in uh, last week. By the way, how was the Shreyas' talk? Was it okay? I thought it was marvelous. Um, 
But this is the UT, it's an ultra short echo time sequence, very similar. And so when, when you have ultra short echo time, you can actually see plastic sometimes. And here you see uh, this thing over here. This is the respiratory bellows. Like it's this basically a belt that you put on top of your stomach and it basically tracks your respiratory. So you can uh, gate your acquisition based on the respiratory uh, signal. Um, so you can also see, uh, um, yeah. So if you notice here that the respiratory bellows are actually on top of the, uh, of the coil, usually that's not the case. Usually you put them underneath, but because this coil is very flexible, you can actually put it on top. Um, the top image is a short echo, uh, echo time image, which uh, shows the signal from the bellows co uh, cover. Now note that the curve is where the coil is in close proximity to the body for maximum SNR. Okay, so the, the coil is actually underneath the bellow. Okay, so you can see kind of really the really strong, very nice signal. In a 20 patient study uh, usability, uh, 20 patient usability study, we found that the flexible coils is preferred by everyone uh, to the commercial 32 uh, channel coil uh, that was compared against. And the SNR of the images were similar. And this was published a few years ago in radiology. Flexible substrates can neatly conform to isometric surfaces, but cannot conform to any shape uh, without, uh, without wrinkling. This work out of Purdue uses a stretchable fabric with the threads conductor woven uh, as a spring into the substrate. This enables the coil to conform better to arbitrary shapes, though capacitors remain rigid and discrete in this case, right, like here. Any change in geometry can cause change in resonance or coupling. So the fact that you change the geometry of the coil, you're gonna change the inductance, you're gonna change the resonance frequency. Uh, and this is somewhat mitigated by the matching circuitry and preamplifier -ampl pre uh, decoupling. Um, basically your electronics afterwards tries to mitigate with some of that, uh, of those issues. I'll bait with you know, some limitations. These are some images. This one from ETH Zurich Group. Here they introduce a novel non-toxic liquid metal encapsulated in silicon tube to enable uh, the elements to flex. Interface is done through a copper insert and the coil elements are integrated into a flex, flexible textile. The conductivity of gallium indium uh, is of course less than copper but it's still enough to achieve body noise dominance for uh, 3, 3T and I think even 1.5T. Okay. So this is just examples of images of a knee when it's being flexed using this flexible stretchable coil. This one is also from ETH, looks very similar where they replace the liquid metal with a very flexible and stretchable conductive elastomer. Okay. The matching circuitry and amplifier chosen in this work provides some flexibility for the change in matching conditions as the coil elements stretch. So they chose a particular matching um, geometry, kind of a, it's called a pi match network, as well as a Preamplifier that is somewhat resistant to uh, impedance mismatches. So it still produces pretty good uh, noise figure. So it doesn't add noise, even though it's not matched perfectly. Yeah, so you can do these really nice kinematic studies. All right, variable trim capacitors are often used by coil engineers. They make it easy to tune and match without needing to solder and desolder rigid, rigid capacitors, uh, like you see here in this work, uh, which were not even possible when using novel conductors and substrates. Okay, this work is 
uh, this work is from our group uh, to make a flexible variable capacitor. This capacitor is constructed uh, with series and parallel plate capacitance for rough and fine tuning. We use uh, low loss spiral X AP flexible PCB. Tuning is done by cutting or soldering traces on the capacitor, mimicking the use of a trim capacitor. So it allows you to change capacitance in a nice controlled way. The previous approaches required separate flexible substrates, flexible uh, conductors, and flexible <coughs> capacitors. All of these can be found inherently built into transmission line resonators. Okay. So here's, it's actually this very interesting work. So um, this is a regular coil, right? Like you have uh, conductor, capacitor, conductor, capacitor, and so on and so forth, right? So then that made it to resonance. But you could also have a transmission line, and transmission line has its own inductance, but also has capacitance because you know the, the center conductor is separated by a dielectric from the outer conductor. So there is capacitance there, so you can actually make it resonant. This work out at NYU shows the use of a coaxial transmission line as coil elements. The resonance is controlled by the length of the wire, its width, and the cuts that are made in the shield or the inner conductor. So you can make these cuts over here or in the, or in the inner conductor to control the resonance frequency. This particular design also exhibits very high impedance than traditional coils, and therefore the currents in the coils are reduced. Um, thus reducing the coupling between elements as well as robustness to geometry. And this is actually a subtle point. So if you have, if you have a coil and it's picking up a signal, so basically it induces uh, an EMF in the coil. Now EMF is, is pretty much voltage, right? But voltage can also carry current. Well, it depends on the amount of impedance that the coil has. If the coil has low impedance, then if you induce a lot of EMF, you also introduce a lot of current. If you have current in one coil, then it would also in induce, maybe if, if it couples to a coil next to it or the, the one next to, to it, it can induce currents in that coil. And basically they can couple to each other and, uh, and then, uh, you know, kind of, you can't really ignore that part. Like they all, kind of you have this coupling between all those elements that you have. And so one element basically sees the currents that another element sees and so on and so forth. So you get a mess there. And that changes actually your whole resonance. And so your efficiency is, uh, goes down to the drain. But if you can have a high impedance and you know that's still, and it's still resonant. So the EMF is gonna be uh, induced, but the current is gonna be low. If the current is low, then it's not going to induce much current in the neck nearby coils. So effectively decoupling that element from the rest. That also makes it uh, also robust to a little bit bending and things like that. Again, because a lot of those phenomena are because of these coupling that happens between different conductors if you have a lot of currents going on these conductors. So on the right, you can see a multi-channel hand coil with elements woven into a glove. Okay. While the coil is very flexible, right? You can see all the nice elements here. The, uh, the electronic isn't, which shows really the importance of a holistic solution. So you, you want everything to be kind of small if you want to make the device to be really, really flexible. So you got all this electronics here and all the Q spoiling here, like the detuning circuitry and all sorts of stuff going around here. Now, coaxial uh, resonators are all the rage now, and rightfully so. On the left, you can see work from Vienna, where they implemented multi-turn, multi-gaps in the resonator to provide more flexibility in frequency and size. Okay. 
On the right side is the work from Leiden. You can see a transmit receive coaxial array using shielded coaxial transmission lines, demonstrating the possibility of using transmit as well as uh, as well for a flexible unicoil. Okay, so this is a transmit receive array, not just to receive only. And so this actually doesn't need the coil detuning circuitry because the coil itself is being transmitting. And so you don't need to have that, but you do need to have a transmit receive switch um, connected to that. This is how flexible these conductors are. The Leiden group in their paper showed a very nice analysis of the performance of these shielded coaxial coils. By the way, uh, these are all inspired from amateur radio, if you didn't know that, uh, where um, amateur radio enthusiasts have used coaxial, shielded coaxial antennas for a long, long time. Um, now, if you look at here, since the distribution, if you look at distribution of current on that coaxial shield is very low. So here's the conventional and the distribution is pretty uniform. It's very high current going on the conductor. That's a conventional loop. In a coaxial loop, you've got two loops. One is the shield and one is the inner conductor. And you can kind of see that the, uh, you know, the current concentration kind of varies, you know, from being high to kind of low at some other points. On the, on the, in the inner loop, but the inner loop is being shielded by the outer loop. And the outer loop actually doesn't have a lot of currents on it. So that effectively creates this effective high impedance. Um, uh, let's see. So these, uh, these coils are robust to changes in geometry as compared to tradition coil, making them better suitable for flexible application. This is, this is actually, you look at the kind of the resonance as you bend the coil and you see the coaxial doesn't change much, but conventional, you know, kind of see how it changes a lot in terms of its resonance frequency. So this would, would shift quite a bit in resonance frequency and it cues. So the, the amount of dip also changes as you move, move it around. Uh, and this is what happens when you bend and you see that coaxial and conventional, they, they behave very differently yeah, because of that. Um, I have a question. Yep. Uh, why is the high field or high current focused like on the two bottom ends of the coil, the coax cable versus- For here? Uh, can you go to the previous slide? I like, think I yeah. did, but I just, just oh, fine. yeah, yeah. So in the middle figure, there's like red on the bottom, and then like the lower current on the top. Yep. Uh, why is it like focused there? I don't know. Um, uh, it, uh, you know, it has. I think it has to do with. I I, I actually don't know. I mean that that was uh, it's it's how they distributed capacitance is, you know, is uh, distributed throughout the coil and the inductance is a little I wonder if that has anything to do with the size of the coil versus the wavelength, so, but. Oh, it's much smaller than the wavelength, anyway. Mm -hmm. uh, we're talking significantly smaller. These are, um, let's see, um, 10, 10 by 10, I guess, kind of. Uh, 10, 10 centimeters diameter loops, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, two pi mm -hmm. r will give you, um, let's say 10 times uh, six. six, so 60, right? Mm -hmm. 60 centimeter. The wavelength is about, uh, it's over two meters. So it's two and a half meters. Mm -hmm. So the wavelength is a lot longer I see. than the diameter. And that's very typical uh, to this type of, uh, it's called magnetic loop antennas, uh, where you can have actually efficient antennas that are smaller than the wavelength because they have a high Q and they resonate. Actually have one here. It's called Alex Loop. Hold on. Pull it up. Oh, 
Uh, yeah, hold it. So we've got the coaxial line. And then you connect it to uh, this box. So one here and then one here. And this box is pretty much a variable capacitor where you can then change the frequency of this antenna. So similar thing. All right, so our colleagues at Stanford have uh, been collaborating with GE to test new technology uh, that uses wire loops with integrated on-coil amplifiers. These are also extremely flexible devices. Uh, the publications are cryptic in detail, um, but some information can be found in the patent application if you're actually interested. So there's a patent application. Um, these coils, in addition to the interface electronics, are also able to provide excellent isolation between the element as seen in the video. And in the video, what I'm going to show you uh, pretty much is what's called a um, um, you, wait, wait, you basically, it's a, wait, you look at the resonance of one coil as you move another coil next to it. And you can kind of see how the traditional one basically is being destroyed in ter terms of resonance. But the one on the right actually um, is pretty much untouched almost. I mean, there is a little bit interaction, but it's much much, much less than the traditional coil, again, because of the amount of currents that go on to on these loops. So here, you know, really pretty bad resonance. And then once you pass, now they de decouple again. That's, it's called critical overlap. But here, it doesn't matter. It's like, no matter how, what distance is, you know, pretty gives you good. So it gives you freedom in uh, placing your coil elements as you wish which is nice. You don't have to worry about the geometry so much, how you place them. Images on the right show excellent coverage and signal in accelerated 4D flow exams of a pediatric patient. And again, in a 20 uh, patient study, the preference was towards the flexible coil. This indicates that flexibility is really needed for pediatric patients. So these are the quilt elements and these are the, I guess the pre-amplifier boards, but they, they have more stuff on them than just pre-amplifier. With all the difficulties and challenges, it's encouraging to see the industry starting to move in the direction of ultimate flexibility. Here you can see several blanket coils for adults and pediatric patients. So this is definitely exciting. So a lot of manufacturers are starting to um, to make these blanket coils. Okay, the untold secret in the coil business is that most problems come from cabling. RF engineers spent most of the time routing cables and putting RF traps or balance to minimize parasitic coupling to the elements and the body transmitter. This becomes a nightmare as the channel count increases. So this is, for example, a coil. You see all the cables. And then what you have here are what's called cable traps. And you see all these cables. And what you have here are called cable traps. Okay. So what are these? The coil element is not the only conductor which interacts with the transmit field. During transmit, very high currents can run on the shield of a coaxial transmission line, endangering the patients. Okay. To reduce these currents, cable traps are placed along the conductor within the bore to block unwanted currents. Okay, so that reduces. This slide is courtesy of Fraser Rob. In many ways, the addition of cable traps is similar to the damming to damming, uh, the damming a river. Here we see the Mississippi River 
where we can imagine the different states are coil elements and the Gulf of Mexico is the system ground. You can attempt to slow the river down, but it keeps flowing in principle, but it keeps flowing, so no matter what. Um, but if you put dams, it slows it down. So in principle, you can have 2,000 to 3,000 volts from one end of the conductor to its other end when it's placed in the body coil. Right? So the body coil is kind of more like a hurricane, dumping a lot of RF rain onto, onto the coil. This would be generating high currents unless balance are applied. Now a commercial 64 channel coil could sometimes have more than a hundred of these traps um, within, within the coil in order to block these types of currents. So pretty much on every cable and sometimes a few on a cable. So what are cable traps? So this is the model of a coaxial cable. The signal current in the inner conductor is compensated by current in the inner shield to form a differential signal. This is the differential signal that we want. Pretty much it's being shielded, it's not seeing outside. And so you got really nice, uh, this, is, this is the behavior that you want. Now, the outside of the shield is isolated due to skin depth effect and um, a skin depth effect. So uh, effectively, you know, currents cannot actually uh, at high frequencies don't penetrate conductors. They don't. They only stay on the surfaces. So the outside of the shield is effectively not connected to the inside of the shield. So currents can flow freely on the outer part of the shield. Um, so uh, they're, they're, and they, these are parasitic so-called common mode currents that can uh, easily uh, freely flow there. Okay. So that, that is a real issue because effectively whenever you have a conductor, now that this is the signal and that's fine, but the outside of the shield, that's, that's where the trouble is. That can interact with the uh, transmitter. Now, similar to uh, detuning circuitry, cable traps uh, use a resonant tank to create high impedance on the shield of the coax. This can be done by coiling the coax. So you take the coax and you coil it. Um, and that forms an inductor. Okay. Um, and then you attach a capacitor in series to this inductor, thus creating high impedance. So any current that goes tries to go through sees a very high impedance because of this resonance. Now the capacitor, uh, so fortunately the differential signal is not affected because the capacitor is only connected to the shield, the outer part of the shield and not to the inner part of the shield. So really this is from the differential signal, this is what the differential signal sees. It doesn't see anything like any different and any changes. It's the common mode current that flows on the shield that actually sees this uh, resonant tank. Okay. So common mode current sees a high impedance and is blocked. Does that make sense? So if you think of a differential signal, it just you know it keeps on flowing. It doesn't care. Right? It flows inside. It doesn't matter if it coils or stuff because like whatever you have current in the inner conductor, it's the inner part of the shield has a reverse current. So nothing is affected outside. So that's, uh, um, do you think that that's a problem? Have you seen that, that, that kind of a problem anywhere? Have you ever seen these things? Hold on, let me. Have you ever seen these things on a cable? Like you, you have a cable and you'll have one of these kind of on top. Have you ever seen, seen this thing? Don't say no, because I, I, you know, I swear to you, you probably have one on a USB cable or something like that. 
like everything will have, you know, here's a, here's a charger. Okay, this is just a charger. You see that thing here? Basically, most, most devices will have some of these. Now, these do exactly what we're trying to do, block common current that flow in the shield. The thing is, this, this is magnetic. It's uh, made out of ferrite. It's, a, it's, a, it's, it's iron. So you can't really put that in an MRI scanner. And so an MRI scanner, you can't use ferrites, so you have to use resonant traps. And that's that work on one frequency as opposed to on all frequencies. Now, the most common cable traps are the one you've seen before, um, you know, the uh, solenoid one, um, or a floating shielded trap, which inductively couples to the cable. Unfortunately, these are resonant structures. They are very sensitive to geometry changes and hence rigid, heavy, and impede the flexibility of the entire system. So that's an issue. Ekin, you want to say something here? Sure. <laughs> oh, you can go. <laughs> okay. So this is Ekin's work. Uh, so this is from our group. Uh, we've been working over the past two years on a flexible cable trap solution. The idea is to use small toroidal structures that are made resonance via twisted pair transmission line, similar to how coils are made resonance. Okay. Um, the torus are self-shielded and only weakly interact with each other. So that allows you, so therefore we can cover the entire cable with these while providing high impedance everywhere while maintaining flexibility. You can see the difference between a system cable with traps and our traps. We call them caterpillar traps due to their appearance. Kind of look like caterpillars. Fortunately, these caterpillar traps are RF hungry and can block RF much better than discrete uh, traps. In the figure below, this one, you can see a B1 measurement, so B1 transmit measurement experiment in which a B1 map under a winded cable is collected. The system cable exhibits some B1 distortion. So you put, you put the system cable here and you kind of coil it. And now you measure the B1 field you know, in a phantom underneath. How do you measure a B1 field? Remember, we briefly talked about it. Oh, you have a homework question. Send the right? homework, yeah. Yeah, that's one way, but there's the other ways. How do you measure B1 field? So it's kind of like, a, it is, right? It's like a problem, right? Like you excite, and what does it mean B1 field? Well, you, let's say you target a 90 degree, and you have B1 homogeneity, so you get like 85 at some places and 110 in some other places, right? Um, so that is B1 transmit non-uniformity. Um, so how do you measure? I mean, like you don't know if the signal is low because of B1 or it could be just because of the magnetization at that place, right? There's kind of like a ambiguity. So you have two unknowns and like one measurement. So what do you do when you have two unknowns in one measurement? You take another measurement? Yeah, that's independent, right? So that's, that's exactly what you do. So for example, uh, if you apply, let's say you target 20 degree, and now you apply 40 degrees, which is two times alpha. Okay. So in one situation, you should get sine alpha times the magnetization. And the other case, you get sine two alpha times the magnetization. So you do some tri tri uh, trigonometry and, you know, from two alpha, you can kind of 
estimate basically now what is alpha. And once you estimate alpha, you know the weight V1 field. So that's a call a double angle method. I have a question. Yeah. What's the scale on the right? Uh, this is just the, uh, uh, I guess, the ratio of nominal, uh, of actual to nominal. It's like whatever, so whatever, like, oh, sorry. No, you explain. Go ahead. It's like the, like with the B1 measurement, you have like a target flip angle um, that you're targeting. Um, and in this case, it's like 30 degrees. So it's basically whatever is the measured flip angle over the target flip angle. So for both cases. So it's off by 30% or so. Um, I guess so, yeah, even a little bit more. Um, yeah. in the top case, yeah. So if it was 30 degrees, it's 10 degrees off or something. So mm -hmm. it's going to be so, 20, 20 degrees or something. It's like, yeah, 20 to 40. 20 to uh, 40. 40, 45, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So that's the situation with this, but because this blocks all the time, um, then, uh, uh, you know, more, I guess, than, than a, this actually is completely transparent to the RF, which is nice. You got all the space here that it's not protected. So there is some currents that can build up. There is some voltage that can build up across this, but it cannot build up across this. But, but why do you see dark purple at the edges? That's like 0.3, right? Well, that, that's the, I mean, there is, there is a inhomogeneity in general of about 20% in the transmit field anyway. So I guess this all needs to be normalized to where there's no cable whatsoever. Yeah, there's also one in my slide without anything that also has that darkening, basically. It's a, yeah. If you remove the cable, then, uh, I mean, you get exactly the same thing because the transmit field is inhomogeneous anyway, a little bit, 10% or something like that. Okay. Uh, all right. So, you know, cables are a nightmare, but then, I mean, wouldn't it be just better to just get rid of them? I mean, you can try to put all these valence and all that stuff, but really, Ideally, you'd like to get rid of them. So, um, so we'd like to have kind of a coil which has no cables whatsoever, perhaps wireless. Okay, um, but wireless coils are very challenging. They require power, uh, digital acquisition, and transmission, as well as synchronization. And so, this is the work from uh, Greg Scott and John Polly where they've demonstrated key pieces to making wireless coils inc that include uh, wireless power. Okay, so this example of wireless power inside the bore. Synchronization. So the ability to synchronize uh, the signal of the receiver and the entire system. And then data transmission. Uh, sorry, uh, Q-spooling and then data transmission. So using a millimeter wave in the magnet. So the missing part so far um, is a miniature uncoiled digi digitization. And this part has actually been demonstrated by ETH group where they uh, effectively made an ASIC that captures, uh, you know, amplifies, and digitize the signal on the coil and then serialize the data out uh, to be transmitted optically to, um, you know, to the host computer. So with all these pieces there, uh, are there just for pretty much integration. So the, the challenge will be to put all of these things together and make that system work, which is still pretty challenging, I have to say just because of all the other stuff that you've seen, right? So that needs to be done. All right, that's pretty much it. Sorry. Uh, 
implemented flexible course posing challenges, safety and performance. Um, I did show some new technologies like flex, stretchable substrates, conductors, components, um, and then geometry, coupling, resilient matching. And then miniaturized interfaces like small preamp straps on coil DCs and so on and so forth. Done. Oh, just three times slower than what I'm supposed to be. So it's good. Any questions? Is Ink Space, I know you're associated with it, are is it still R and D? Or are you guys like actually selling flex coils? Or no, they're not selling. They they still have not uh, gone through the five ten k approval, mm -hmm. like FDA, pretty much. But you can see there's a long list of things that needs to be done. <coughs> I have a question. Do you have any data for noise to comparisons? For what? A flexible coil to a conventional coil? Uh, yeah, how do you, actually. How do you one. measure SNR? Um, you can do it on the same phantom, but it really depends on the, on, I mean, you put, you put the one coil on the phantom, you put in the same, another coil on the same phantom, and then you compare SNR between them. Yeah, but how do you measure SNR absolutely? It is, well, relatively to each other, right? You can always compare. No, but can you measure SNR without being relative? How do you just measure SNR? I mean, it gives you SNR. It's just like you don't know how good you are compared to the ultimate possible. No, I'm asking measure. a more basic question. What do you can mean? You just, can you just go over SNR measurements? You went over B1. Well, SNR, you, you can just measure the noise level without exciting and then measure an image, and then take the image, divide by the noise standard deviation of the, of the noise. And that gives you SNR. And what's the setup in terms of phantoms and coils? Well, it depends what you, um, what you want to simulate or emulate. Noise, I'm so, just saying, how do you measure noise by itself? You have a phantom or not? Uh, you, you put a phantom, of course. Because uh, otherwise you don't load the coil, so the noise, you know, it will be different, right? When so you, you actually... never, so you never measure noise of the coil without noise of the sample. Is that right? No, you can, but it will give you pretty much that measurement. It won't be simulating a reality which you put on the body, and the coil will be loaded, right? And and be affected. So it, you know, it's um, it's never and, really and worthwhile that... to measure noise no, without the sample no because also the coils are not tuned actually right. they're not tuned right. and matched to those so i'm saying it's not worthwhile to do that yeah uh, it's not, no it's not completely true what you're saying it's huh. like sometimes it's worthwhile because if the coil elements are elevated they're usually not as loaded as uh you know designed and so there, in that case, you know, you might see lower SNR in some coils compared to the rest or, you know, worse performance. But, you, you know, the conclusions that you make out of it, you know, are really dependent on what you want to try and test, what scenario. I guess I'm trying to understand how you, how you measure quality, like. Like a quality or, assurance? Not quality assurance, just validating noise and SNR, like, do you look at, do you look at noise correlation matrices or what, what do you okay, actually so, measure? Okay, well, hold you know, so, or... so when you look at when, okay, so when there's an array and we haven't talked about array, so that's why I'm a little bit reluctant to go into this and because we'll, we'll talk about it uh, next week. Uh, then the measurement of noise is a little bit more complicated, but there's a really nice paper by actually Michael's dad, you know, Peter Kellner. Uh, about how to do that, how to do exactly those measurements. And, and that really depends on how you go and combine the data and stuff like that. But, but there's a really a good process of doing that, uh, of, of 
you know, evaluating SNR in arrays. And you have to then measure the noise covariance matrix because you know the correlation between them and account for that and all that kind of stuff. Okay, so so if we go back to one coil, if you're yeah. just talking about one. Yeah, that's pretty easy then. Well, is it easy? Because we talked about B1 and transmit fields not being uniform. Like how easy is it to measure SNR for one coil? Yeah, it makes what assumptions do you make? Do you make an assumption that you've got a uniform B1? A uniform, a uniform. Oh, I see what you're saying. So first of all, okay, so the first thing you do is you can measure B1 and see how non-uniform is it. Right. Then you do an acquisition, which is independent of T1 and T2, so proton density, right? So then it's not affected by that. And if it's a uniform phantom, that's not a problem. Then you should really get uniform signal everywhere. And then if you do have some B1 variations, you could compensate like for that flip angle you know, to know kind of what is really the true signal there. And then you measure uh, the noise without uh, without exciting. And now you got yourself image over noise standard deviation, and that's it. Or actually your image is signal plus noise. So do you subtract from your image uh, I, noise and then divide no, by noise? No, because what you do is you, you get like a very high value image. So you can actually, you know, each, I mean, you could also locally average if you really care about that, but like the level of noise usually is the factor of a hundred or even more sometimes in those type of measurements. And you can design them that way. So it doesn't really matter. So the signal that you get is really signal, even though it's contaminated by noise, but that, 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 is, that is very small. So that's not affected in that ratio. It's like you take a hundred plus, you know, one divided by a hundred, it's still close to one. Right? Well, the reason I ask is because you had a picture of a cervical spine of a conventional yeah. coil. It looked really noisy. Remember in the first or second slide? So in that image, it looked like there was signal and with the, it had a lot of noise in it. So I was trying to understand how you'd compare. This yeah, one? The one on the left, is that noise? Yeah. That's noise, yeah. right? That's signal and noise, yeah. So my question is, you know, do you subtract out noise from this image to figure out the signal to noise of that. The noise, doesn't, the noise doesn't really move move you much in the in the mean, right? Like the noise is kind of right. So you could you could if you wanted to. I mean, yeah, like every noise estimate, like every estimate of noise, right? Like even the standard deviation when you want to collect, right? It's standard deviation. It's an estimate of the variance. Uh, sorry, it's a, it's a est, you know, it's a it's a it's a sampled standard of, uh, deviation. It's not the actual standard deviation, right? Like it's like you don't really measure variance, you measure sample variance. So everything is an estimate anyway. It's just like, you know, what is your, what is the variance of your measurement, right? Like if I have a large sample size, so I make like lots of measurements of noise, then I can estimate very good the, you know, like I have a good estimate of the variance. Right. If I have only two observations, that's not going to give me a good, you know, a good. I, I can't compute the variance with two measurements, right? Look. Right. So, like, even even when we, add, we want to estimate noise, you need to have enough measurement. So, um, the the effect is very little if you have a noisy image and you want to divide that with the noise. I mean, it's it's gonna it's gonna have some effect, but of course, any any noise map is also noisy. But you can actually you can actually bound it if you really wanted to, like how much it's noisy. Out of curiosity, is it just because you're used to looking at these pictures? Could you roughly guess what what's a number for SNR on the left versus a number for SNR on the right? I mean, I don't have any intuition, but you probably do. It's probably, right? it's probably more like 100 and this is more like 20. Okay. Something like that, roughly. Yeah, I mean, even 20, I mean, it's pretty high. So like, it's not really gonna affect you, right? Like 20 divided by, um, like if, if, if the, you know, noise standard deviation is like 20, then if you have something that is 20 less, right? So one over 20, it's, 
plus one divided by you know uh, it's it's not gonna it's not gonna make a big difference. So every time you have excess SNR, you could speed it up and trade off. Not not and, every time. Well, let, I mean, I'm just saying sort of roughly. I'm just saying yeah. if Shreyas was gonna. This is just kind of a rough question, but if Shreyas was interested uh, in you speeding something up, and he says this one on the right has excess SNR, can you accelerate it for me? And you say, sure. How far down would you go and it would still be useful to Shreyas? Like, does he just need an SNR of three and he'd be able to still do a diagnosis or does he need 20 or does he need 50 or just kind of roughly? It depends on the diagnosis. Like well, if you're looking so. for, let's say, uh, lung nodules in an MR, which is also almost, you know, yeah. impossible to see anyway. Well, then you need maybe a hundred or you know five hundred. Yeah. And if you wanna, if you just wanna see, I don't know, like uh, the thickness of the heart, you know, and to see the boundaries because of that, then maybe an SNR of four or five would be enough, yeah. you know, to do that segmentation. So it like everything it depends on the application right if you want to see small structures that are fine uh, you know if your contrast the other thing is if your contrast to noise ratio is high then you still you're still okay if your snr is not that high so uh it depends like everything uh ultimately is really the ability to diagnose something right so that's uh you know, to see something subtle, you know, you definitely need higher SNR. And if you have too much high SNR, you can always make the slices thinner, maybe, or, you know, higher resolution. Uh, although not always it's possible. So sometimes you just get an image which looks nice. All right, folks. Um, so no um, artifact thing. We'll do it on Thursday. Okay. I think that the, the artifact actually I have to say this is one of the most important part because uh, it really that's that's where I feel that you kind of maybe understand finally all the things that we put together. You know, like uh, phase encoding and you know bandwidth and you know signal to noise ratio and then like. All that kind of stuff, like if it's put together in a nice way, they all come usually from some Fourier reason. So, um, and so please, uh, please come, we'll do it, it'll be fun. Hi, everyone. This meeting is being recorded.